Hi, I'm James Dunn. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In Depth, and my guest is Marcus Bogdan, Chief Investment Officer of Australian equities boutique Blackmore Capital. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you for having me. Marcus, could you describe the opportunity set, the universe that Blackmore chose, and uh, why you chose to have that opportunity set as the place to, to play in? Sure. Um, it's the ASX 300. We're a long-only inv investor, which is, which is important because we spend a lot of time in the field talking to companies and industries, uh, and we want to be part owners of, of, those, of those businesses. Um, all of my career has been based around Australian companies and Australian industries, and, and hence that's the, the uh, area of competency that we've, we've chosen. So that raises the question about sectors, and uh, clearly you have to be able to look at resources uh, as well as uh, any other form of industry that's in the uh, ASX 300, so you have to be agnostic as to sectors. Absolutely, and across the team we've got competency in each, each of the sectors that we look at, uh, but we're benchmark unaware. Uh, we're generalist investors, which I think is important because we don't want to have those underlying biases for particular companies or, or, or industries. So if you have a 300 focus as opposed to a, a 200 or 100 focus, does that mean you are less concentrated in your universe than say a large cap specialist manager would be? Um, it's important that we, we want to have diversity in the portfolio. We want to have different drivers of return and different dri drivers of, of risk. But where we see an opportunity, we will be more concentrated. So we'll, we'll flex and contract where we, see, where we see those opportunities. Do you have to keep watch on companies that are growing up towards potentially coming into the 300? And, and I suppose, for, for how long do you watch those companies? Because I've always found it a paradox that um, a lot of managers say, look, I like that stock, but I won't buy it until it's bigger. Yes, sure, and it then becomes self-fulfilling. And we watch those stocks for two reasons. One, they may be disruptors mm. to particular industries, and two, uh, their road uh, to sort of economic prosperity is at the Nassian stages, and we want, to look, we want to look at those things. But to be realistic in our portfolio, those positions at the, the bottom end of the A6300 would have a very small part in the overall portfolio. You recently won the Best Australian Equity Managed Account Award, which, um, I mean, those sorts of recognition uh, must, must be good, but uh, could you describe what goes into that in building a career towards those kinds of accolades? And for how long have you been working and uh, what's been the most important lesson over that journey given that you would have seen several downturns? Sure. I mean, I think history is impor important. Uh, and across uh, the sort of nearly 30 years I've been working in the industry, each decade um, has had a significant event. When I started my career uh, at the end of the last Australian recession, we'd just gone through uh, the worst banking crisis that we'd seen in, in Australia. You know, the Bank of uh, Victoria, mm. South Australia Bank, Pyramid. Uh, so it really focused my attention of things that could potentially mm. go wrong um, and the importance around liquidity, solvency and a strong, and a strong balance mm. sheet. Uh, and that has been embedded in my entire career mm. and that was very important to understand those lessons when we went into the global financial crisis, which was a, a global banking crisis at that point of time. And the reasons were, were, were different. Uh, but the underlying effects were very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And again, in this year, what we've seen in the pandemic when uh, business models have been interrupted, mm -hmm. uh, that the focus on earnings resilience and balance sheet mm -hmm. strength is, is absolutely paramount. And you don't know when these events are going to occur. I want to ask you a question about art and science in investment, because obviously all of the, all of the numbers have got to be important, but What's the art side, the subjective side? When, when you 
finally, after studying the spreadsheets, go to meet the management? Is, is, is that where EQ really comes into it and it is a, a bit of an art? And there is, and there's, inter there's interpretation, and I think process is incredibly important. And when you do go to, to management, it's not just the one meeting, but it's the meetings that you have over a period of time when you're ob observing behaviour, you're observing changes in, in a company or, or an industry, seeing whether the catalysts identified are co coming through or not. And so I think that is part of the interpretation uh, and part of the art form and then marrying that up to the sort of the, the, sort of the harder science mm. of, of fi mm. financial uh, evaluation. When you're really excited about a company in terms of the numbers and, and, and then it does get down to face to face with management, uh, have, have there been situations where a negative impression is so strong that it, that it trumps the, the feeling you had from the numbers that this is a good stock? What we we use multiple points in our decision making, so we won't anchor onto one particular uh, input. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking a holistic approach, and it's looking at all of the factors that we that we put in into that mm -hmm. to make a to make a decision. It's interesting that over the length of journey you've had uh, to come to a point now where ESG is such a mainstream consideration. Can you describe for us uh, the, the process by which, in recent years, that's become so important in assessing investments? Yes, and I think it's absolutely accelerated in, in the last year, and we're, we're seeing that from sort of the external interest there. Mm -hmm. uh, and our approach has evolved. I mean, we're bottom-up investors, so it's, you know, governance and safety have always been um, a paramount mm -hmm. importance in terms of determining value. Uh, but it's important that we have our own signature in the way that we look at, mm. look at ESG. Uh, we're not using negative filters, but we want to see both the positive attributes of that ESG and potentially the where well, um, uh, value can be, can be destroyed. And so we've developed our own methodology mm. and philosophy around, around that, to, based on materiality to companies and, and industries. So given your opportunity set is the ASX 300, uh, if you were to describe the process that goes into identifying the real core long-term holdings of that, would it be just a given now that very strong ESG uh, strength uh, criteria is, is, a, is a given in that process? Yes, it is. I mean, we have, um, in our analytical framework, there's sort of six elements that we would focus on earnings quality, industry position, balance sheet strength, management mm. and board, ESG and valuation. So it is one filter, but it is, it is an important filter mm. uh, across, across that spectrum. What's it like being a, a veteran and um, in, a, in a boutique, uh, you, your own shop uh, and employing people? I mean, you, you, you've obviously um, honed a process over many years and, and in one sense it, you'd probably want your employees, younger employees to be clones of you in the mm. way that they approach mm. uh, the, the, the rigour and the thoroughness mm. of looking at a stock. But on the other hand, you want the diversity of opi opinion that younger people bring. What, what's, what's that like in, in building a team? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, you know, we've worked in very large organisations, but we do feel we want to have a, a smaller team where everyone is account, accountable. Uh, and we do want to be challenged. The, the PMs challenge each other. The analysts challenge each other with, with new, mm. new perspectives. Uh, we, we absolutely welcome that. But then underlying that, there are elements that, uh, you know, that uh, are pretty fixed around attention to detail mm. and having that inquisitive mind. What are your favourite sectors for the Australian market going forward? Um, th three areas. Um, I think consumer online, but particularly around consumer staples. Uh, it's the largest part of retail, but it's had the, the least penetration online. And there's a range of reasons for that around the complexity mm. of delivering uh, grocery online. But you can see there with you know, Woolworths doubling their, their on online sales, and that process is improving. It's, it's going to be its mm. own profit centre. And it'll also be an important moat for for the for the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the second area is healthcare, uh, and we do like the elements of a, an aging population. 
you know, the, the rise of chronic disease and also what we're seeing this year around pandemics and vaccines and the importance of, mm -hmm. of that. Uh, and the third element would be around renewable finance mm -hmm. and renewable energy. So Macquarie, uh, f a very important mover into uh, renewable energy and renewable mm -hmm. finance with the acquisition of Green Bank. Uh, and they're looking at that as mm -hmm. the next decade of area of growth, just as they did uh, looking at hard mm -hmm. asset infrastructure in the, in the late 1990s. What about technology, which has attracted a lot of uh, excitement and all the rest, uh, but you know, people wanting us, wanting us almost to emulate the US market in having a, a, a buoyant technology sector. And we do have some really world leading companies, but do you think that's uh, a sector in Australia that is worth looking at and having in the portfolio? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, we do have examples of extraordinarily good businesses, not only locally, but internationally. If you look at Zero, if you look at REA, I mean, those mm. technology plat platforms are absolutely world class. Mm. But then we're also looking at incumbent companies mm. and how they embed this new, new technology um, in, into, the, into their operations, mm. which will continue their competitive advantage. What's your view on uh, the focus on income in the Australian market? I mean, investors, uh, difficult to know what's the driver, chicken or the egg. Investors demand income, they demand franking credits, and companies have responded with high payout ratios, etc. Do you think that makes the Australian market a, a little less efficient than it should be? Um, I think it is improving, but I think historically we've lent too far into the importance of income, uh, particularly when it's unsustainable. Uh, and there's a number of example, industry examples to look at. One is the banking mm. sector, you know, payout ratios 80 to 90 per cent. There's just no mar margin of error when you're at that sort, mm. of, le at that sort of level. Uh, and it was incongruous to what was happening mm. globally. Mm. You know, banks in Singapore, 30 to 40 per cent payout ratios far more sustainable model. Uh, you've had uh, companies which have been in structural decline, Telstra, the dividend cut from 32 cents to, to, six, to 16 cents. And then you've had issues around progressive dividends mm. in a highly cyclical company like BHP. And one of the best things that they did was uh, to, uh, to move beyond that policy mm. and, and then build it back more to the underlying earnings of, of, of the company. So I do think we are improving, uh, but historically I think we have lent far too much and, and been far too reliant on income, which is not sustainable. So uh, flowing from that, what, what is your view on the banks? Because that was obviously where people came to expect a, a, a very high grossed up dividend yield. And, and some investors did start to feel that was almost like a coupon. Yes, yes. And look, and from our perspective and, and being agnostic to the market, we didn't own the major banks from 2015 to 2018 because we could identify that the banks were over earning uh, and the dividend payout ratios were, were, were too, too high. Going forward, uh, um, importantly, I think bank earnings have, have probably troughed and dividends have also troughed in this last reporting season. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing we're, we're, we're a much healthier base mm -hmm. going forward of probably low credit growth, but far more sustainable mm -hmm. dividend payout ratios of 60 to 70 70 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and the banks do have uh, their unquestionably strong capital positions as well. Mm -hmm. and, I, and finally, I think on the deferral side, that has certainly been better mm -hmm. from a mortgage and an SME perspective mm -hmm. as, as well. Could you give us some insight into some of the really high conviction uh, holdings that you've been building up and, and really expect to perform well for you in 2021? Sure. Um, one company that we did bring in uh, early on in this year at the beginning of the pandemic was Goodman Group, the online logistics and warehousing mm -hmm. group. Um, we liked the, the, the sort of the ownership and of, of, the, of the company, the space that they are operating in, the diversity of their income around um, development, mm. management uh, and, and rent, and also um, the conservatism of the balance sheet with 10% with gearing, coupled with mm. you know, seeing earnings per share of, of sort of 10% or more. 
going into 2021. One of the areas that has been deeply affected, even though it's an essential industry, has been healthcare. Mm. So you've had the, the impact in some of the businesses mm -hmm. in CSL uh, and, in, and in Ramsey. Um, we think that uh, particularly in the private health, health uh, hospital uh, position, I think um, you'll see a catch up mm. both domestically and the other jurisdictions that they're operating in. And I think and as an industry, uh, it's strengthened where the partnership between the public and the, and the private will allow mm. Uh, more elective surgery to be taken mm. into the private sector. What's your view on the agency risk of short-term tenure of management in Australian companies, which is a, which is a big problem? And, and the example of Goodman made me think of this. Do, do, do you look actively for the, the less agency risk opportunities where there's very strong founder alignment and, 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 and almost aspects of a private company? Yeah, we, I mean, we're absolutely attracted to that owner-manager model. It's particularly hard to find. There's not terribly many examples. But even when it's not present, we do want to have that, that ownership feeling of, of management as well. Not only management, but also of the board and the competency of the board as well. To what extent are ESG considerations paramount now in, in putting a portfolio together? They. I mean, it's our, our sort of interpretation of it, but it is one element of six elements, uh, but it is absolutely embedded in, in the process. And we have sort of three, three sorts of reasons why we would particularly sell a company, mm -hmm. uh, and ESG would be, would be one of those. But one would be um, a deterioration in earnings, which we felt was structural, mm. a deterioration in balance sheet, which we felt was structural, or something around mm. ESG, which threatened the social licence mm. of, 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 a, of a company. So the ASX didn't embed social licence to operate in, in, in the rules, but it sounds like from what you're saying that investors know when it's no longer there. Abs abs absolutely, and I think it, it, it's becoming uh, an important part to, to embed mm. in, in our, our investment, investment process. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks for your time. Pleasure. Cheers.